Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Nari Hishmati. I'm a board certified OBGYN uh, in the North Seattle area near Everett, Washington. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk to you about gestational diabetes of pregnancy. But first off, as with all my videos, I like to incorporate a little bit of background from the beautiful Puget Sound area. And so I've just got kind of some of our, our nice greenery and hiking trails and things like that. Today, I'm not too far from an area in Muckleteal called the Japanese Gulch. Now the Japanese Gulch is called this because in the 1900s, uh, mills and uh, were a really popular source of employment and we had a really high number of Japanese immigrants come into the area uh, and work these jobs and a lot of them were housed and located in this area that was called the Japanese Gulch. Now as those jobs went away in the 1930s, 1940s that name stuck and more recently that area there's been a huge effort to preserve the area, make sure that we've got the hiking trails in the area, to maintain a lot of the culture and the nice things that we can see there. Uh, so the Japanese Gulch, great place to get some activity, to get some hiking done, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about in this video is why activity is also going to be important if you have diabetes or pregnancy. Now what is gestational diabetes or diabetes of pregnancy? It's basically somebody who does not have diabetes outside of pregnancy who develops diabetes during the course of their pregnancy. Now what's diabetes? That's simply the term we give to the medical condition when you have too much glucose or blood sugar, too much sugar in your bloodstream. Now, that can cause a lot of effects and problems, so that's why we want to keep an eye on it. Now, one of the questions that patients often ask me is, well, why would I develop diabetes during pregnancy if I didn't have it before pregnancy? Imagine there are tons of changes your body's gonna do to accommodate and take care of this pregnancy. Now, one of those is gonna be increasing insulin resistance. So insulin is what your body releases to take that blood sugar and move it into your body cells. Now, over the course of your pregnancy, you get insulin resistance, so your cells don't respond to that insulin, so your blood sugars can stay higher. Your body's gonna accommodate for that by increasing your insulin, but sometimes it's just not enough, and this is probably a protective effect in order to get the baby more nutrients. Uh, but sometimes it can be too much and you can be a diabetic during pregnancy. Now, there are some people who are gonna be higher risk for having diabetes in pregnancy than others. So for instance, if you had diabetes in your last pregnancy, higher chance of having diabetes in this pregnancy somewhere around 40%. Uh, if you start off your pregnancy and you're overweight, if there's a family history of diabetes, uh, genetics plays uh, a big role as far as race. So African Americans, uh, American Indians, uh, Asians, Hispanics, uh, uh, Pacific Islanders all have a higher risk of developing diabetes in pregnancy. Your prior history, if you've had a really big baby, higher chance of developing diabetes during your pregnancy. Now, if we went just on risk factors alone, we'd only catch 50% of all diabetics. So back in the 70s, it was proposed that we should do a two-step screening test uh, to determine if somebody has diabetes in pregnancy. And in current practice today, we test pretty much everyone because we don't want to miss anyone. And that two-step screening test starts off with the one hour, 50 gram glucola test. Um, yeah, in our practice, and what we see a lot of times is that's the orange sugar water drink that you'll see people drink. Um, yeah. A lot of people will come tell me, oh my God, you don't know what this is, tastes like. I have tried it before. It's not that bad. It is a lot of sugar, so 50 grams of sugar. Um, to give you a perspective on it, a Snicker bar, that's about 20 grams of sugar. So that's two and a half Snicker bars. No, you cannot have two and a half Snicker bars and check your blood sugar and that counts as your test. Uh, but basically, somewhere between 24 and 28 weeks, you're gonna come in and we're gonna give you this 50 gram sugar water test. Um, there are no huge diet restrictions beforehand, but don't have anything to eat right before you come in. And we're gonna look and see where your blood sugar is an hour later to see if you need to go on to more screening. So the general cutoff that we're gonna use is somewhere between 130 and 140. Most places are using a value of 135 or 140. I personally use a cutoff of 140, and I think that's probably the more common one that you're gonna see. Uh, the difference between which value you use comes down to simply your screening population and where you want to be. So with a cutoff of 140, I'm going to test fewer people through the second part of the test, but I'm probably going to miss some diabetics. Whereas if you do a cutoff of 135, you're going to miss fewer people, but you're going to put more people who don't have diabetes through the second part of the test. And the second part of the test is a three hour, 100 gram glucose challenge test. Or checking a blood sugar for fasting, and then after the 100 gram challenge, at one hour, two hour, and three hours, two of those being abnormal, we would consider you a diabetic in pregnancy. 
Now, the reason we do this testing around 24 to 28 weeks is, you know, we discussed a lot of this can be hormonal effect. Well, one hormone that plays a kind of an outsized role in this is HPL, or human placental lactogen. And so if this is around the time that we're going to be seeing these peaks, and it's going to be an ideal time to test people. If somebody has significant risk factors and we're really concerned, we might actually have them do an earlier test, but we're still going to test them again around 24 to 20 weeks. Now, why does it matter that we pick up on who has gestational diabetes? You know, if somebody has gestational diabetes, they have higher risk. They have a higher risk of a big baby. They have a higher risk of preeclampsia. If their blood sugars are poorly controlled, they have a higher risk of a stillbirth. They have a higher risk of polyhydramnios or more fluid around the baby. Um, there's increased risk of needing an operative delivery, meaning either forceps, vacuum, or cesarean section. There's a higher risk of shoulder dystocia where the shoulders get caught up from a baby during the time of delivery. So that's why it's really, really important. But one bit of reassurance I would give you is, let's say your blood sugars can be managed well without the need for medications. Your outcomes outside of baby being a little bit larger are very similar to a routine pregnancy, and we're probably not going to do a whole lot of extra testing or induce you early, things like that. Now, once you have the diagnosis of diabetes, what do we do? Usually we're going to send you to a diabetic or a nutritional counselor. They're going to talk to you about diet changes, what you should eat, how much you should eat, and to see if we can check your blood sugars and keep it under control. So we're going to want you checking your blood sugars four times per day. Fasting, so when you first wake up, one hour post meals. Basically breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We're looking for a fasting number less than 95 and a one hour post meal of less than 140. Some places will check a two hour post meal and then you're looking for a number of less than 120. Now, how do you get control of your blood sugars? Well, the average uh, person during their pregnancy is going to need between 1,800 and uh, 2,400 calories per day. Now, that's going to vary significantly from person to person, and this is where it's going to be really important uh, to sit down with somebody and talk about what you should be eating. Uh, the average person eats about 30 calories per kilogram per day, but that number, 22 to 24 if you're overweight, down as low as 12 to 14 calories per kilogram per day if somebody's obese other thing is going to come down to is what you're eating. So you want the makeup of your meals to be about 40% carbs, 20% protein, and 40% fats. And it's really important with those carbs, you want to focus on complex carbs versus simple carbs. Simple carbs are more likely to cause a rise in your blood sugar after your meals. Um, simple carbs are basically things that you add like uh, brown sugar, plain sugar, things like that. Your complex carbs, quinoa, uh, whole grains, things of that nature. Now, one of the other things is you want to try to add in some activity. So I'll ask my patients, you know, add in a walk every day, maybe three times a week if you can do a half hour of cardio, something of that nature. Adding in moderate exercise or activity is going to help lower your weight. It's also going to help increase your insulin sensitivity. So it's going to make it easier to manage your blood sugars. Now, let's say you do all of this and you just you can't get your blood sugars under control. That's when we're going to start monitoring your pregnancy and doing extra things. So in my patients with gestational diabetes who are well controlled with diet, I'm going to talk to them about fetal kick counts, making sure baby's moving well, but otherwise I'm not going to necessarily intervene or induce them early. In my patients who have blood sugars outside of those goal numbers of 95 fasted or 140 post meal, then I'm going to be looking at do I need to start them on a medicine like an oral med like glyburide or do I need to start them on insulin to try to get them within that range. Now these are higher risk pregnancies, so you're going to see some variation around the country. I personally, around 32 weeks, I'm going to increase fetal surveillance, meaning non-stress tests, ultrasounds to look at fluid, and I'm typically going to induce these patients at 39 weeks because in patients who have poorly controlled diabetes, we'd worry about a higher risk of stillbirth. Um, now one of the other things I'm going to do in all of my diabetic patients is, and this is specific to my practice, but other practices also will have a similar idea. Is, we're going to do a growth ultrasound between 36 and 39 weeks to see how large is the baby. Now, as we all know, ultrasounds are not perfect. There's going to be a huge range of variation, but we're basically trying to anticipate is who has a baby who could be over 4,500 grams. Um, that's a little less than 10 pounds. Uh, the American College of OBGYN says in somebody who has diabetes and pregnancy and a baby anticipated to be over 4,500 grams, we can consider doing a C-section. Uh, and that's in order to um, prevent uh, brachial nerve injury or palsy. Now, one of the things in the baby, uh, one of the things to think about though is we really individualize this for patients because if you look at the data out there, we have to do four or 500 C-sections 
to prevent one of those injuries. So just because there's a large baby doesn't necessarily mean we're always going to do a C-section, but it is something we might sit down and discuss and say, hey, these are our options, this is the risks and benefits in your case, and come to a plan jointly together for how we do it. Now, what is going to be different when you're in labor? In labor, usually we're going to check your blood sugars every two hours or so because we want a blood sugar of less than 120. If your blood sugars are running high, we're probably going to start some insulin during your actual labor course. Now, the good news is very few people will need that because during labor, you end up using more glucose. Labor is an intensive process, so often blood sugars are well controlled on their own there. The reason we're looking for a number less than 120 is if your blood sugar gets too high, the baby is going to produce a lot of insulin. And then when the baby comes out, we're going to see an increased incidence of neonatal hypoglycemia or low blood sugar transiently in the short term in the baby. So that's something we really want to avoid. Uh, and you'll often find our pediatricians are going to check blood sugars immediately post-delivery in patients with diabetes to keep an eye on them to make sure that everything looks good. Now, once the pregnancy is all done, um, then in general, that your body should return back to normal, meaning you shouldn't have diabetes of pregnancy. But just to be certain, we're going to test everybody postpartum once they're recovered. So somewhere between 6 and 12 weeks, people come back and we do a 2-hour, 75-gram blood sugar screening test. And we basically want to make sure you don't still have diabetes outside of pregnancy. If you do, now you've got real diabetes and we're going to sit down and talk about what do we do about that. If you don't, you still are a higher risk for diabetes long term. So this just gives us information that's going to be helpful. So there's anywhere between a 40 and 50% chance between 20 and 30 years out you could develop diabetes. That's more common in certain people like Latin Americans. Uh, it's less common if you breastfeed, so another plug for breastfeeding. Uh, but in general, it's a good idea to have, your, be, have yourself screened for diabetes every three years or so to make sure you haven't developed diabetes in pregnancy. Um, so I hope this has all been helpful for you about what diabetes in pregnancy is, how we're going to manage and what we're going to do differently. And I hope it also encourages us all to get outside and be a little bit more active and enjoy a lot of our, our native scenery. See you later.